I'm Dr. Lisa Lamb, and I teach preaching as a visiting professor here at Fuller Seminary. I'm especially passionate about seeing preachers in the developing world resourced and encouraged and uh, equipped to to preach. I am going to be reflecting today on Deuteronomy. of us can remember when our parents dropped us off for college, and then some of us are old enough that we remember dropping our own kids off for college, waving to them through teary eyes and trying hard not to nag. But the truth is, we worried if we were the parents. Will she forget the faith that we've worked so hard to form in her? Will he be drawn in by the crazy dorm scene all around him? One of the final rituals of the weekend is usually a trip to the bookstore to buy a sweatshirt or a t-shirt, a symbol of new identity and belonging, belonging to a new tribe. And at that point, the journey is complete. Moses in the book of Deuteronomy reminds me of those parents. Right at that moment where they're itching to get on with it and get into the promised land, Moses parks them and talks to them. At length, (laughs) he is filled with hopes, and yet clouds of worry are popping up on his horizon as well. And that's because he knows human hearts. This book is filled with striking insights into the human heart, into human nature, our tendencies toward pride when things are going well, our tendencies to grumbling and panicky fear when they're not going so well. And of course, the college student analogy breaks down that he's not sending off an individual, but he is, in fact, using every word here to form his listeners' unique identity as a community, building into them the values and the vision that will sustain them as they learn what it looks like on the ground to live as the deeply beloved people of God. It's been said that the first word of Torah is beginning, and the last word of Torah, the last word of Deuteronomy, is Israel. The trajectory from the beginning has been toward the formation of Israel as God's treasured family, and this book seeks to guide them in every aspect of that formation. It exhorts them to treat each other with honor and compassion and to treat immigrants in their midst with generous justice and hospitality. In Moses' understanding, that faithful obedience is fueled by memory. And so he exhorts them to regularly retell the stories and kindle the memories of how God has redeemed them and been faithful in covenant love to them. Shaped by that lively memory, they will extend grace to immigrants, to gleaners, to widows. And as they do so, they're promised abundant blessing. God wants his people to flourish. He wants it to go well for them. A much repeated phrase throughout the book, that it may go well with you. God makes some lavish promises actually of material blessing for them, but ultimately God wants it to be well with their souls. And as this book is a work of soul formation, it does not just spell out how to keep the rules, but it digs into the inner motivations and attitudes of the heart. The last thing I love about this book is how much it guided Jesus, who lived as the embodiment of faithful Israel. He quoted from it often. In fact, when he was tempted in the wilderness, all three of his responses were grounded in the warnings and promises found in this book. The God of Deuteronomy is his teacher and his father. And Jesus knows the mercy at the heart of his father, and so he can trust him and not turn to shortcuts. Like the people of Israel who are about to leave the wilderness, Jesus in the wilderness stood on the cusp of a new life, and he chose faithfulness. Like Moses, he too would suffer and intercede on behalf of his people as a true servant leader. May we do the same as we face wilderness seasons and alluring shortcuts on our own journeys as we learn about the needs of immigrants, of orphans, and other vulnerable people in our midst. 
May we be generous in the ways described in this book, and may we see God fight our battles for us.